the rest of the lecture will be about the image formation okay and this is purely uh, purely from the perspective of the observer in this case it could be your eyes or it could be the image that you want to form on some screen maybe okay or maybe you want to put some image on the films on digital CCD whatever okay so that's what this purpose is just to figure out what type of image that you're going to get and where the image is going to appear so those two questions will be answered based on this sort of like con conclusion of the type of images that you're going to get right so there are two types of image that eventually you're going to have to face one is obvious is real the other one is not real is a virtual image the easiest one for the real image is the one that when you go to class and then the projector the LED projector or whatever that project the slide onto a screen that is real the reason is real because you can put your hands there and then whatever the text or whatever the image fall upon your hands yeah that's real you can touch it pretty much well touch mean you can use your hands to be a screen instead of the actual screen but the virtual image is the one that you cannot pretty much interact with it directly the most obvious ex example is going to be when you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning or in the bathroom and all the stuff you can see with your eyes but you cannot touch it you cannot do anything with it you can only observe it you can see it you can <laughs> you know look at it but you cannot do anything with it that is a virtual image okay so the reason for the real and the virtual is classified by that is because the real image is from the real intersections or intersecting between the light rays so as this figure is showing so the image is real because you can see now there are so many rays of light converging into a single point okay and then you can think of this convergence and converging point to be a focal point you can think of it that way so that's pretty much a focal point so every time you want the image to be clear and everything has to be sort of like nice and no blurry stuff you say you want to put everything in focus right that's what you say right hey you want to you know set the focus right to get the image sharp and everything that's what it is okay when you place your screen at the correct point then the intersections between those rays are perfect that's when you get a clear image and because those rays are actually crossing each other that is the real image is it good all right so that's the idea and that I throw in the word focal point in it so put in focus and all this stuff just to showcase that you need to consider the point where the rays are intersecting and that will be the point that image is going to form now if you look down here this is the uh, the scenario when you look at yourself in the mirror this is what happened okay so it could be something point source it could be some object you can place some object there that could be object or whatever and then you try to look at it the thing of this one is the light that coming out from the object is going to get reflection from the mirror and now you start seeing what happening here so if you look from the top one of course the light has to follow the law of reflection so it's incoming equal to the incident beam yeah that's always the case and then you keep looking down at many many points along the mirror whatever point you're looking at the incident and the reflected angle has to be the same all the time however when you look at all those rays do you notice something here because the light is trying to divert from the source once it hits the mirror it get reflected back if you place your eyes right here okay you will notice that the rays is diverging that's opposite to this this ray is actually converging mm -hmm. into a focal point 
this one is diverging out. So when you place your eye there, okay, you only observe the point where the image supposed to be, but it's not real <laughs> because you only have to look it through your eye and your brain always interpret that. Whenever the light hit your eyes, the brain will think that the object is directly in the front. I mean, directly straight from that line. So when the, li uh, when the light hit you straight, I mean, it doesn't have to be, it always hit you straight, of course. The light hit your eye straight forwardly. So it's just like, hey, come in, bam. And then your brains interpret that the object must be from the initial point of that line. So that means when the line of light over here is diverging and hits your eyes, your brain will interpret that, oh, okay, the source must be coming from here. That is the image of the point source. But it's not the real source because the real source is over here on the left. So that's why what you are seeing over here is a virtual image. Okay, you guys, I hope by seeing these two figures, you can sort of see the difference between the real image and the virtual image. So usually the virtual image is the image that you can observe by eyes. You cannot place this one on a screen. You cannot put this one on the CCD sensor, anything to take a photo, I mean, put it in the print and I mean, nothing. You cannot do anything because the ray of light are diverging. You cannot focus it onto anything else. So the only way that you can pretty much notice this one is using your eyes. And then your eyes will assume the point of the source by extrapolate that ray outward. And when you see the crossing between those rays, that is the location of your image. But this is a virtual image. Okay, sounds good? <laughs> okay, so these are the two. Okay, so conclusion is, you're gonna get a real image when you actually see the rays crossing among each other. And at the point of crossing, that is the location of the real image. On the other hand, for the virtual image, you're going to observe the diverging light or the diverging rays. You have to extrapolate that ray into the point of crossing, but that crossing is a virtual point because there's no ray there it's going to be your extrapolating arrays. So that's a virtual one. So that is your location of the image. It's still the location of the image, but that is just a virtual image. Okay, sounds good. All right, cool. So what you can see over here is the way that you're gonna make rays e either converging into a point or diverging out, it must going through some deviation of light. You have to pretty much bend the light. Bend, they say bend mean the light has to go into a different directions. So that's why the law of reflection and law of diffraction comes into play. Because reflection, as you can see from this condition over here, you know, change directions on and on. So that's nice. So you can make the ray diverging out. Or you can see over here, if you can see that the light is actually going through some transparent material over here and then it get refracted. So by having the refraction, you can, you know, shape the direction of the ray to make them crossing each other or maybe diverging out. So that's what it is. So that's why the law of reflection and law of refraction eventually will be used here to talk about the formation of image and all this stuff. Okay, right here. Let's start from the easy one, a plane mirror. Okay, you already saw that the plane mirror doing this. It's just a reflection, and it's a symmetric reflection, actually. So the easiest case is the one that you look on the right over here. Okay, so I'm going to use this one to sort of explain what's going on with a simple reflection plus what kind of terminology that, we, that we're going to use. So let's say I place an object at point O. Okay, of course, there will be a light coming out. When you say coming out of it, it doesn't have to generate the light by itself. It might be reflection from the environment and then sort of, you know, shine the light on it and the objects just reflect that light out from itself. Okay, so let's say you have 
a light source right here or maybe the objects reflect lights from the environment or the stuff so you can think of it as a source of light anyway so what you have over here is the light coming out from point O and all of those rays will eventually hit the mirror and follow the law of reflection so incoming angle equal to outgoing angle so let me change the color a bit so right there so there's no big deal okay incoming equal to outgoing same law of reflection but then on the way out you can see that now the ray is diverging out so the only way that you can get to the location of the image is you have to extrapolate 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 so as you can see point i that's a point where those diverging rays virtually virtually crossed okay of course there's no way that you're going to put the light behind the mirrors because all the light will get reflected out so behind the mirror there's no way that you're going to get any lights so these are all virtual okay so if you measure the distance from the object to the location of the mirror let's name that p that will be your object distance and then the location of the intersections of the rays if you measure the distance from that intersecting point to the plane of the mirror that is the image distance okay all right so now that is the one that you can use the object distance the distance from the mirror to the object the image distance is the location of the image to the mirror all right but this one you can see right away this is going to be virtual image and in this case because it's just a simple reflection what you can see for the condition of the plane mirror is p equal to i the object distance is going to be equal to the image distance done image is virtual all right so in reality even though the object is not a point it could be like having some sizing or whatever so you can use this arrow to represent an actual Im uh, actual object with some height okay so that is a height however when you try to do this and analysis you're always starting from a point anyway for example even though this is an object with some shape there is a height into it but you always look at some point on that object for example I want to look at the tip of the arrow and see what's happening so at the tip of the arrow eventually we'll come back to just condition on top you guys with me and what's saying about this distance that is equal between the object distance and image distance suggests that the tip of the arrow will appear right here with the equal distance okay and then you can just move along and then you hey I'm gonna consider the bottom of this arrow but by the condition of the reflection from the plane mirror I would say the distance of the bottom of the arrow to the mirror will be the same as the bottom of the image to the mirror so you can do this every point on the object you're gonna trace an image of those points and eventually you're going to get the full image of the whole object and the conclusion stays the same if you place an object in front of the plane mirror you get the image of that object deep into the back of the mirror but with the same distance just like when you look at yourself in the mirror <laughs> all right maybe I over explain this simple case but I hope that's what you try I mean that's what I'm trying to say that uh, in the analysis you always analyze a point but it could be a point on a real object so if you can pinpoint one single point on the object you can pretty much draw the conclusion for the whole object even though the object has some height some you know some tallness and all this stuff in there you don't need to consider everything you just consider just a single point of the object and then once you know where the image is formed that's it that will be the position of the image as well of the whole objects there sounds good
All right, but this is just so simple enough that okay, this is your starting point. Plane mirror give you the image distance equal to the object distance. That's the plane. Uh, that's the plane mirror. Okay, let's do one more. Okay, it's gonna be more fun if the mirror is curved now. That is more interesting. When it's curved, now you start to manipulate the ray into a different directions. So now you have a chance to make them cross virtually, or it could be cross really. <laughs> I mean, really cross or virtually cross. So you can generate a real image or virtual image depends on which kind of curve you try to introduce into your mirror. But all in all, you will have only two choices to make. The first one is on the left. If you have a concave mirror, this is the hard one to think about it. But when you say concave, it means the center of curvature, representing as point C right here, C, that's center of curvature, is towards the front of the mirror. That's when you get the concave mirror. Okay. Because the Thai thing is wow. <laughs> if you sort of understand this word wow, get to wow. So it's wow is like concave away from you. It's I mean, concave away. It's it's not a good word, but wow means it's sort of like away from you. Okay. And in the opposite case, if the center of curvature is behind the mirror, yeah, point C is now behind the mirror. In this case, you get a convex mirror. And in Thai is noon. Oh, this is not bad. Gajok noon ok man. So wow and noon are just opposite words. Okay, noon is just come coming towards you, and wow is sort of like away from you, something like that. Okay, so I mean, however, if you look at the light, that's gonna be easier because if you shine a light, and if the light is just like a straight light that is parallel to something, I can name it. Central axis, so you just draw a line, horizontal line that cuts the mirror in half. Think of it that way. All right. So that is your central axis, and then you shine a light parallel to this axis. So you just get like a horizontal line of rays coming in. So what will happen? You say, well, Adan, that's no big deal because you're gonna have to follow the law of reflection all the time. So when you shine a light horizontally, you're gonna get reflection, okay, and it's gonna come down. If you look at the bottom half of this, you're gonna get exactly the same situation. So you're just gonna have the reflection, and you can see by just considering these two rays, the reflected rays going to cross at a point. Now you introduce a real intersections between rays. So you are guarantee what you're seeing over here. This is going to be a real focus, <laughs> right? Because that is the point where the rays are actually crossing themselves. Okay, and that's nice. So what you see is this configuration of the mirror try to converge the rays to cross each other. So there is a better sort of meaningful names of this kind of mirror. We can call it a converging mirror. Okay, cool. Now look at the opposite case. If you do the same thing, but now you look at the convex mirror, so you shine a light parallel to the central axis, so it's horizontally traveling to the right. Hit the mirror. You do the same thing. Law of reflection apply. Okay, no problem. So in equal to out. So now you can see that the outgoing rays is going to be diverging. See that? Okay, so it's diverging out, diverging out. So by introducing the convex mirror, you are diverging out the light. So that's why you can name this type of mirror to be diverging mirror, which is more meaningful, I think. Okay, and in this case, now you can see that these two rays never gonna cross. Okay, they never gonna intersect. So what you can do is just extrapolate this one backward. Okay, and then eventually they're gonna cross at some point, but it's just gonna be virtual crossing. 
So that's why you can think of this one is like a virtual focus, which is behind the mirror. Cool. All right. So now by seeing this, now you start seeing that, okay, that I can see that now having the mirror in a way, sort of cut the rays, then you can bend the light. <laughs> you can redirect the light and then you can do it in two ways. One way is you redirect the light so they eventually cross each other, really cross each other, and then you get the real focus. In the case of the diverging mirror, you put the mirror in the way, then you redirect the lights so make them diverging out. So in that case, you have to extrapolate the rays, you get the virtual focus. But it turns out, because you follow just the law of reflection, by doing simple geometry, you can say right away about Ajahn, if you measure the distance from this point F, the point where they intersect themselves, toward the center of the mirror, this is going to be half of the distance from the central point or the center of curvature to the midpoint of the mirror. You guys think about this one, does that make sense to you? Because point C, that is just the center of a circle. So you can imagine that this mirror is part of a big circle right here. And the C is just the center of the circle. Well, my, my circle is bad. <laughs> okay, not supposed to be that big. Okay, that right there. Okay, point C is just the center of a circle. But then you try to cut this everything in half through the law of reflection. So the distance from C to the circle must be twice the distance from F to the circle. So that's why you get this relationship that the focal length, the F. Yeah, now you start saying that, oh, that's the length of the point F. Let's call them focal length. So the focal length of this one is just going to be half of the radius of curvature. Perfect, that's nice. So now from this point on, if you look at like, if you somehow have a chance to have like a mirror that look like a curved ball, and if you know the radius of this ball, <laughs> okay, then you can determine the focal point or the focal length of this curved mirror right away. It's just half the radius. Isn't that nice? Okay. But everyone say, well, of course, John, because you have a law of reflection, you cut everything in half. So that makes sense. Okay. All right. That's cool. However, things get more interesting. Because what you're looking at right now, you assume that the incoming ray is just horizontal rays. And when you say you have a horizontal rays, what do you think the horizontal ray representing objects where? If you have an incoming ray generated by some object, where would that object be? Until you have the ray that looks like parallel, like this, parallel. <laughs> it's parallel. Oops, sorry. It's parallel. The ray come in parallel like this. Where can you get the ray of light that looks so parallel like this to the horizontal line? You have to say that object must be so far away, super far, like sun, for example. Okay. When you look at this, you don't supposed to look at the sun, but when you take the sunlight, fall onto the ground or on the earth or something, you can assume that the direction of the ray is pretty much parallel to each other. Right? There's no diverging, there's no converging, and because it seems like the sun is so far away, and then we are so far away from the sun, that the ray is supposed to be sort of like, you know, not diverging out or sort of converging out too much. Okay, so you can think of this one is the object is at infinity, far away. Okay, sounds good. So in reality, you're not gonna have objects so far away like that. So let's look at this one. The first case, this is just an example. So you might have an object placed somewhere, okay? And then you can, of course, you can measure the distance from this to the center of the mirror. You can call this the P, the one that we already named this one, an object distance. Okay, and your task or your job is just to figure out where the image should be. 
And the trick is quite simple. When I say the trick is this. Once again, I pick a point, okay? And usually I pick the tip of the arrow or the tip of that object and just try to think of what happened to the light that's coming out from that tip of the object. That will be one point that's easy to think of is if there is a ray that coming out from this one, okay, let me use the orange one here, or let, let me use the blue, that if there is a light coming out from this one and it's travel parallel to the central axis, it's going to behave just like what you saw before here is the reflect, the reflected ray eventually gonna hit the focal point. So that means I can draw this curve right here and it's going to hit the focal point right there. So that's the ray number one. That is done. That's easy. Okay, let's do one more ray. Let me do the green. I can pick any point that I feel comfortable with drawing the ray. I can say, well, Ajahn, can I do the reverse? If I pick a ray that actually travel and going through the focal point in the front and hit the mirror after, do you think what will happen to the reflected ray? Of course, well, Ajahn is going to come out horizontally. You guys with me? Right, because the hor horizontal ray come out cutting the focal point. So if I have a ray that cutting the focal point, it should go back horizontally. So let me name that ray number two. And now do you see where these two rays are crossing? It's right here. The red dot right there. And that's it, I'm done, my job is done. I can see that now the two rays are actually crossing each other. So this image that I'm forming right now is supposed to be a real image. It's real, first of all. Second, if I measure the distance from this point to the mirror, that will be my image distance. Perfect. Plus, I can even notice that Adan, the direction, I mean not direction, yeah, you can think of direction, but the image that is formed, it's actually inverted. It's upside down. That's fine. That's possible. So it's an inverted image, upside down. Plus, if you look at the size of the image, well, Adan, it's kind of shortened from the original height. Yes. So it's reduced in size. <laughs> and that's it. That's the conclusion. Once you place an object at the distance a little bit away from the mirror, but it's not like infinitely far away, you form an image that is still real, but inverted and reduced in size. That's how you figure out the image formation from some, in this case, curved mirror. Sounds good? <laughs> I hope everything is doing fine. Uh, everything is, 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 I mean, everything is going fine and you guys are doing okay. <laughs> okay, try again. Okay, let me use the bottom case just to contrast what happening to the first one. Okay, let me try again. Now, if I have a diverging mirror, the convex mirror, and I place an object in the front, but now it's pretty close, actually. I'm placing it quite closely to the mirror. So all I'm sort of, all I'm doing is just try to figure out where the rays that coming out from the object is going to cross, right? So once again, I pick a point. And once again, the tip of my object. And I'm just draw any rays that I know how. I can draw an, any rays that I want, but I would just want to draw the one that's easy to draw. The first one is, once again, the one that's come out horizontally, hit the mirror, and everyone knows what's going to happen. The ray is going to get reflected back, but it's going to re get reflected back in the direction that actually is extrapolated to be going through the focal point. You guys with me? Okay, because this is actually just the case of this one. You have a parallel ray coming in. It get reflected backward, but it's backward in the direction that's actually in the same line with the focal points. 
Same idea over here. Exactly what happened. Let me call that ray number one. All I need is one more ray, and then I can draw the conclusion of where the image should be. So I pick another point. Let's say if I have a ray that's trying to get to the focal point, the green, the green. If there is another ray that is shooting toward the focal point, but of course, it's never going to get there because it hit the mirror first. What is going to happen, guys? Of course, you're going to get the reflected ray that's come out parallel because that is just the reverse of what's supposed to happen when you have a horizontal rays. Okay, so if you have a rays, try to hit the focal point. It's not going to hit it. It's going to get reflected. And the direction of the reflected ray is going to be horizontal. Let me call that ray number two. Once you look at the ray number one and look at the ray number two, you can say that, oh, Adan, these rays are diverging. So they're never going to cross. What I'm doing over here is I'm just going to have to extrapolate. Okay, I'm going to extrapolate. Here we go. So on the way out, my extrapolations could come here. Look at the black dot right there. Okay, and on the way out for the green, the ray number two, it's just horizontal. You see that? So the intersection between these two rays is at the red dot, but it's an extrapolated ray. So they are not really crossing themselves. It's virtual crossing at the red dots. And if you measure the distance right here, that is your image distance. The distance from the object, that's always the object distance. And you can see now, you're going to have a virtual image. Right side up, so it's upright. There's no inverted image right here. However, the size is reduced pretty much. Okay, so you get a smaller image but it's still upright and it's virtual, so you cannot touch it pretty much. You can only observe it by eyes. That, is that kind of fun? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So these two conditions is the one that you pretty much see in here. I don't know, have you used this in your house or somewhere? So when you have like a makeup mirror, I don't know, I have seen it somewhere that when you look closely, then it's just magnify your face like super big and then you can do the makeup and all this stuff. I think maybe like women seem to use this a lot. All right, but that's what it is. If you look at the surface of the mirror, it's going to curve a little bit, but it's curved away from you. So actually this one is a concave mirror that when you use for the makeup and all this stuff. On the other hand, uh, this one, okay, this is the, the case that you see at the corner of the street and all this stuff, okay. So what you see over here is, is the convex mirror. It's sort of like curved out. And you can actually see the other side of the corner, right? just to see is there any cars coming and all this stuff. But you will, you will notice that the image over there is distorted, of course, but it's going to be smaller. And because you can see the reflection, you know it's going to be virtual because it's not real. So that's why this is what's happening here. That's a virtual image. Okay, well, Atan why the first case you use this one to represent what we are doing here <laughs> but that's a good question this what you're seeing over here in this diagram is not what you're seeing here in the actual stuff because the difference is you have to be quite far away from the mirror for you to generate a real image but when you stay so close like this the image is going to be different. So that means it depends on the, your location or it depends on the object distance. That's going to determine what type of image that you're going to get at the end. All right. So this is just the first example when the object distance is far away, further than the center of curvature. But then, of course, you can actually move this somewhere you can move it in here, you can move it in there, you can get even closer than the focal point or you can get super close. 
all of these cases will generate image at different distances and even different type even. It could be real, some could be virtual. So before you get to conclusion of this one, you have to learn how to figure out the type of the image, the location of the image or the stuff in a more systematic way. This one is we call array tracing. But just give you an idea what's the difference between the real and the virtual image. But to be able to figure out the actual location and the type of the image and the size of the image, I think you need a little bit better tools than just drawing diagrams like this, right? And that's what we are trying to do right here. So we can calculate that. And that will be the last stuff that we're going to do today. Sounds good? All right. So <laughs> you guys still with me, yeah? All right. So of course, I mean, it's still correct. If you draw the diagram correctly, you can still figure out where the image should be, but it's not going to be as precise as, as if you have an equation to help you calculating this. So that's what we're trying to do here is you need two, or maybe you can think of it three, but actually uh, for the for the the real sort of like the the main equations for your calculation is only two. The first one we call the magnification, which is a simple concept. Okay, so first of all, if you want to know the image is going to get like sort of like bigger than the actual objects or smaller than the objects, all you need to figure out is just measure the height. If you take the height of the image divided by the height of the object, then you can know you can calculate the magnification right away. Does that make sense? Okay, so the magnification is just you know it's a size comparison. That's easy. However, the good thing about this one is it turns out the ratio of the height. Okay, you can think this is the height of the image. That's h prime, and this is the height of the object. That's just the h. It turns out this ratio right here is the same as the ratio between the image and the object distances. Wow, that's nice. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. Just to follow the terminology that used in the textbook, all right? So we're going to use P and P and Q now. So there's so many short, sort of like um, notation that you can use to represent the distance. But for us, I will turn into Q now. <laughs> I mean, originally, I prefer I and P, but because I is saying for the image, but then you guys just like, but P is not for the object. So some textbook use O for that. So it is so much confusing between notation because there's no real conventions of what kind of characters or <laughs> what which characters in English that you want to pick for this. So there's so many, uh, I don't know, choices that you can pick from. For some of you might have studied S, and S prime, that's another notation that has been used. Some of you might use U and V even. Wow, so many things. And some of you, well, so in conclusion, is it depends on what you like. So let me write all those choices here just to make it clear. So it's either Q over P or it could be, okay, let me write on the side. It could be I over O the image over object distance. Okay, with the negative sign, of course. I'll explain about negative sign a little bit later. So it could be V over U. It could be S prime over S. And in our case, it's Q over P. So it's your choice, all right? But the key is, is a ratio between the image distance over the object distance. That's the key, all right? But now there is a sign associated with it. One is, in this case, is a negative sign. There is a reason for it, and, and I will explain to you a little bit later. All right, so we'll come back to the bottom half of this slide a little bit later. Okay, so let's keep in mind that the M is the magnification. It's just a ratio between the image size over the object, uh, the object size. However, you can also calculate from the distance. It turns out the ratio are the same with an extra negative sign. Okay, very good. That's uh, equation number one, that's what I'm saying. Okay, 
I can just I don't want to call the first equation to be equation number one because it's kind of common sense pretty much. Okay. Now the equation number two that's our main equation and we call this mirror equation. Right there. It turns out the relationship between the image distance and the object distance is simply follow this equation right here. It turns out the inverse summation between the object distance 1 over p and object distance and image distance 1 over q equal to the inverse of the focal length 1 over f. That's it guys. Done. That's called mirror equation. The difficulties of this one is just you have to pick the correct sign for each individual terms, the P, the Q, and the F, okay? But I'm going to tell you a simple way that you can pinpoint the signs correctly, and I hope it will not make any mistakes at all if you make it sort of correctly. Of course, if you do it correctly, you're not going to make any mistakes, right? <laughs> Okay, that's kind of like, that's the fact. Okay, if you don't make any mistake, then there will be no error. Yeah, of course. Okay, all right. So the key to use this mirror equation is this. All right, this table might look sort of like, wow, there's a lot of stuff. Okay, but here is the, I would say this is a tip that I have been using, and this is what happening. Here we go. Look at this one. Starting from a converging mirror. Okay. Okay, so let me say this. If you understand what I'm saying right here, you will automatically know how to do the rest of this lecture automatically as well. This is a nice thing, I think. All right, so let's follow my logic first and see if you agree with me. So I will compare the two cases. Of course, one is the converging mirror, concave, and the other one is the diverging mirror, convex. Okay, so the key is this. First of all, if you have a single object in the front, you measure the object distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, this is always positive. <laughs> Why? Because there is no way that you can place your object behind a mirror. That's pretty much like, no, 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 no. So as long as you have a single object, this is always positive. So object distance is positive for sure. <laughs> done that's good now because you have a mirror the light never gonna be able to penetrate the mirror toward the back so what I'm saying over here is you can see that there will be no light behind the mirror ever because the light has to reflect back <laughs> right light rays get reflected back toward the front so if you're going to be able to see the light, if you're going to get the light to cross each other, if things going to really, really, really happen, is going to happen in the front of the mirror, not the back. You guys with me? So if things is going to get real, not virtual, it's going to happen in the front. So what I'm saying here is the logic is for the image to be real, it's supposed to be here in the front from the image. And anything that go behind the mirror is going to go negative automatically. Okay? So let's follow me here. Look at the focal point. The focal point on the, the uh, converging mirror is here, right here. F, the green dot right there. So that's why for this concave mirror, is going to be positive focal length right here because your focal length is in the front of the mirror. Look down here. Your focal point is behind the mirror. Okay, but we already agree that whatever that's real is going to be in the front. Okay, let me use the same color here. Whatever that's sort of not real, virtual, <laughs> is going to be the behind the mirror for the image. So look at the focal point of the convex mirror the focal point is in the back of the mirror so your focal length is going to be behind the mirror so that's why in this case you're going to get the negative focal length for the convex mirror and that's it 
when I say that's it, it's done. If you follow my interpretation or in terms of like how to determine the sign, I think this is the key. The key is you go where the light go. <laughs> and wherever the light go, that's positive. That's where it's supposed to be. If you go the place where the light not supposed to be, that is your negative. That's done. <laughs> and look at if my sort of like tip right here is sort of agree with the with the table, I would say, yeah, here, look at this. The object location is positive when the object is in the front. And it's negative when the object is in the back. But of course, when you have a single object, you're never going to be able to place an object in the back. Then you say, well, Ajahn, and when the object is going to appear in the back, when you have multiple mirrors, maybe, all right, I will discuss this toward the end. But when you have a single object, it's always positive. Look at the image location. It's positive when the image is in the front. That's where the light goes. Wherever the light goes, that's positive. And if the image location is in the back, that's the light never go. <laughs> so that's a negative area of the whole thing. Okay, sounds cool. Okay, so I think the best way to showcase how this is applied is looking at an example. And then I think it's done. And then once you know how to apply this, sign all this stuff, I can loop back and talk about this negative side in the magnification formula and eventually tells you what is the final conclusion about the image. Okay, and that's it. That will be pretty much complete the whole analysis here. Okay, give it a shot here. You only need one exercise <laughs> and then everything will be clear. A concave spherical mirror has a radius of curvature of 20 centimeter. It's concave. Okay, so that's good. So let me draw a diagram here. So let's draw it a little bit big. All right, I have a concave mirror right here. Okay, let me draw this one. The back is on the right, the front is on the left. Okay, so the radius of curvature is given. So that is your R. So that means I can say right away, F is going to be 10 centimeter. You guys with me? However, this is a concave mirror and everyone knows the focal length will be here. That is your 10 centimeter. That is your focal point. And because we already agree that the focal length or the focal point is in the front. So this is a positive 10 centimeter focal length. Now you get the sign of the focal point of the mirror down. That's done. Now they say find the location of the image on the object distances of they give you 40, 20, 10 centimeter. And each case state whether the image is real or virtual, upright or inverted, and magnification. These are all the questions that can be asked. That's it. If you know how to figure out what type of image is real or virtual, is upright or inverted, what is the size of the image, you're done. That's everything that you need to know. Okay, sounds good? Okay, let's give it a shot. So let's start from part A. Part A, I'm going to place my object at 40 centimeter. That's, wow, that's far away right here. Your object is far away. So that means part A, your P, the object distance, is 40 centimeter. All right. Now, the Q, that's your image distance you want to figure out. The focal length is positive 10 centimeter. See? And of course, you can put positive sign for the P because, of course, it's always positive. You have only single objects in the front of the mirror. And now you plug this into your mirror equation. 1 over P plus 1 over Q equal to 1 over F. So this gives you 1 over 40 plus 1 over Q equal to 1 over positive 10. I can put positive sign to emphasize the sign of these parameters. All right, let's work out some numbers here. So 1 over Q is going to be 1 over 10 minus 1 over 40. I can mix and match a bit. So it's going to be 30 over 400. Am I right? Something like so. Okay. So at the end, I flip around one more time. So I get Q equal to 
40 over 3. So about 1.33 or something. 10, sorry. 10.3. Thirteen point three, somewhere around there. Okay, sounds good. As you can see at the end, the Q that you would get from this mirror equation is still positive. It's automatic. Okay, the mathematics give you positive thirteen point three. So what does it mean? It means your image is still in the positive territory, <laughs> right? It's still in the positive region. And we say the positive is where the light should be. And that is in the front of the mirror. So that's why I say, okay, the image is going to be somewhere here. 13.3 centimeter. You guys with me? That's a positive side of the whole mirror. All right. And it's supposed to be real now because it's positive. The image appear in the front that is going to be real. That's the positive numbers suggesting you that it's a real number. Okay, guys. Now, is it upright, inverted? What is the magnification? Now, let's refer, uh, let's refer back to the equation number one. The equation number one says that M equal to negative Q over P. Here we go. Plug in everything that you know. Negative side is there. Q, you just got it, positive 13.3. P, that's your original, positive 40. As you can see, I keep the centimeter unit without any conversion because as long as I'm stick with the centimeter, everything is fine. It's still in centimeter, so that's good. So that's it. Conclusion is negative. Actually, 13.3 is coming from 40 over 3. Okay, so actually, 40 is canceled out. So it's going to be negative 1 third. Okay, cool. All right, so what does it mean? It means the magnification is only 1 third. So it's a fraction of number 1. So it means you get a reduced size. That means if the height of the original object Okay, if the height of this one is h, the image over here will be only h over 3, one-third of the original size. Okay, cool? That's what does it mean by net magnification. But the nice thing about this equation that having the negative sign in there is mean here. If the m that you calculated is negative, it means the image is automatically Invert, it's not automatic. I mean, it's suggesting or is indicate that the image appears inverted. See, so that, that's a good thing about this equation is the sign of the M will automatically tells you is the image is going to be upright or inverted. And in this case that we calculated here is negative. So now we know, oh, the image is actually going to be inverted. So let me put a different sign here. A uh, different color here. And it's only going to be one third of the original size of the object. Okay. And appear at 13.3 centimeter. So, conclusion that I'm getting here is so the image is at 13.3 centimeter in front of the mirror. It is real, that's because it's positive, inverted, okay, and one-third of the original size, original size, done. Is it a nice? <laughs> All right, so that's how it's sort of like, that's pretty much everything in terms of figuring out the location of the image. That's what you do. Sounds cool. <laughs> well, it's not cool, but I, I hope it's 
straightforward enough. Okay. Okay, you want to try again? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's do part B and part C. I think we pretty much know how to do this everywhere. Okay, let's do part B. Oh, it ran out of space. So let me add some pages to this. Okay, so get some more room to draw. But I, I hope this is clear enough. Yeah, you guys with me? Yeah, just make sure that you go through the sign correctly, slowly. And once you know everything, then you plug in into the mirror equations. Solve that, you get the Q. Okay, once you get the Q, the sign of the Q will indicate what type of image you're getting. Is it real? Is it positive? Is it going to be virtual? If it's negative. Once you get that Q solved, you come back to the magnification equation using that m equal to negative q over p that allow you to figure out what will be the final image. What is the size? What is the directions of it? Is it uprighted or inverted? Okay, so let's do one more. Okay, so let me add a page here. Okay. Here we go. All right, so let's do one more here. So I'm going to do part B. Oops, sorry, part B. Now your location is changed to 20 centimeter. But now things will be pretty fast now because you know how to apply this one. So let me do that. Part B, your object location is now at 20 centimeter. I can add positive sign to it because it's always positive. Your focal point of your mirror is always, in this case, is positive 10. Yeah, taking from this. So from here, you can figure out what is Q through 1 over P plus 1 over Q equal to 1 over F. So 1 over Q is just 1 over 10 minus 1 over 20. Cool. And that gives you 1 over 20. It's still positive. So that means Q is just positive 20 centimeter. Ah, so what can you do tell about this one right away? At least it's real because it's positive. Okay, that's good. Okay, now you combine this with the magnification equation minus Q over P. Okay, plug in the numbers that you have already solved for 20. The P is 10. Oh, sorry, the P is 20 as well. Whoa, that's negative 1, guys. So what does it mean? The negative, at least this one means it's inverted. But number one means the magnification is just one. So in this case, there's no magnification. There's no reduction in size. It's just the same size as the object. But then at, the, at least this is it. This is a conclusion. The image is going to appear at 20 centimeter in the front of the mirror, inverted but the same size as your object. So let me draw the diagram for you guys. So in this case, this is where you place the object here, 20 centimeter, and that's your object. Okay, <clears throat> 20 centimeter. But then it turns out, at the end, you get the image at the same position right here, but inverted, same size. That's what it is. But that's to be expected. Can you see why? You're right. Exactly. Because you placed your object right at the center of curvature. <laughs> right? So when you place everything right at the center of curvature, you get your, your reflection come back to yourself because you're right at the center of circle. <laughs> So the light that going hit the mirror, reflect back to you. So that's why there's no magnification. The only thing that you're going to get is just the inversion. 
because it's reflection. So the head will go to the tail, the tail will go to the head. So that's why you get the same size image, but inverted. And the location, it has to be the same location because it's a pure reflection. So you go and you come back. So that's why the nice thing is this equation is saying that, okay, your image location is supposed to be at 20 centimeters as well. All right, sounds good. I hope you see what this is about and that's pretty much it. Part C, I can do very quickly. Part C, they placed the image, I'm sorry, the object at 10 centimeter now. So things will get a little bit, oh, I put double equal sign here, sorry. Okay, so there you go. Okay, so I, I can say one over Q equal to one over P minus one over F. And you guys can see for part C, I just place my object right at the focal point. And that give one over Q to be zero or Q is supposed to be infinity. Can you tell what's going on here? And this is a weird one because it's not weird, but it's just because you place your object right at the focal point. And we already learned that anything that generated from the focal point get reflected horizontally. Yeah, 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 like this, yeah. Everything that's generated from the focal point come out horizontally. And the horizontal ray representing the image, I'm um, sorry, the object at infinity or the image at infinity. So every time you have a parallel ray, it means something is going to or coming from the infinitely far away point. So that's why the mirror equations showcase that one over Q is zero or Q is just so far away. So conclusion for part C is just saying that the outgoing ray is parallel. Or you can say there's no image formation, it's just a parallel ray just going all the way, <laughs> pretty much. Okay, sounds good. All right, so I hope this is not too heavy. And I think, as you can see, the mirror equation is simple equation to apply. It's just a reciprocal sums between the P, the Q, and the F. And why I say, the, the, the sort of like, the way that I'm saying things like, Atan, is this about it? <laughs> it's like, there's nothing anymore. I would say, there is nothing anymore, except, of course, there is one more stuff that we have to talk about. And it's about the lenses. But when I say I have almost nothing left to say because of this. All right. And it will take on only about 10 minutes to talk about this. And I think we can sort of be done with. Apply the same logic, guys. Okay. To me, mirror and lens are pretty much the same thing in the sense that here we go. So you can do the redirections of the ray in the other way, not through reflection, but you can do it through refraction. Would it be cool? Well, yeah, well, Ajahn, you can do that. Instead of doing the curved mirror, you can do the curved surface. And everyone knows every time you have a curved surface, you can get the refracted ray to, you know, change the direction of the ray. So you can have it curved in two directions, just like in the mirror. This one, if you curve away from you, the refracted ray eventually will converge to a single point. So you can call this a lens. Yes. And because this lens is converging the light into a point, this is a converging lens. Okay. And actually this one called convex lens, <laughs> but we sort of like, we don't like the convex and concave because sometimes people get confused. But this one is a converging lens. It's the lens that try to converge the light into a point. On the other hand, the opposite one is, of course, you can have a diverging lens. So you try to go in the opposite direction of the curvature of the medium over here. And by having that curving away from you like this, the rays actually get refracted out. So get the diverging out. And once again, you use the same trick. You just extrapolate that diverging rays and they are virtually crossed right here. So you can think of this on the left to be a real focal point. It's a real focus if you want. And you can think of this one is like a virtual 
focus because there's no ray there. Okay. And of course you can still define the same distance over here and then you can call it focal length, just like what the mirror has. Same thing. Name this one focal length F, same thing. So the concepts of the lens and mirror are pretty much the same, except the mirror apply the reflection law, law, law of reflections. So the light supposed to get reflected back to what the front. The lens apply the law of refraction. So the light supposed to refract and appear the other side of the lens. But the concepts of the lens and the mirror are the same in the sense that you just need something that's curved to redirect the light beam. Okay, sounds cool. And then if you follow my logic right here, the thing happens exactly the same as it's supposed to be. But instead of everything get reflected, everything get refracted to the other side. But everything will look exactly the same. For example, over here, start from this, ray number one. If you have a light, try to get through the converging lens and the ray that coming in is horizontal ray, of course, it's gonna get, oops, sorry. It's gonna get focused through the focal point. You guys with me? Okay. See, it's exactly the same as this one right here. The ray horizontal hit the focal point. Same. But now for the lens, it's go the other side because that's the lens. It used the refracted rays. This one used the reflected ray. Okay, so let me erase that so you guys won't get confused. You see the similarity between the two? Okay. So I can do the same thing with the mirror. If I draw another ray that's going through the focal point, then it's supposed to come out horizontal. See, same trick. And of course, one, I can pinpoint where the intersections between rays are. That's it. That is your location of the image. That's the Q. That is the P. <laughs> See, nice. All right. But once again, we're not going to do ray tracing like this because, you know, you have to draw this, draw that on and on. So you need an equation. Can you guess what type of equation you're going to get? Lens equation. Very good. <laughs> and you look at these two equations. Do they look familiar to you guys? Well, of course, John. It's 1 over P plus 1 over Q equal to 1 over F. Just like mirror equations. No difference. Magnification. Okay. Negative Q over P. So there are the same two equations that you apply with the mirror. The only thing that's changed is what? Is the region of positive sign for the image that gets switched. Okay, follow me guys. Here, I already said, goes where the lights go. <laughs> Just go where the lights go. So for the lens, lights supposed to refract is not supposed to get reflected. So light supposed to appear toward the back of the lens after going through the lens. So for this, the back of the lens supposed to be where the light should be. That is your positive region of the image. You guys with me? You should never, never see the light get returned to the front of the lens again. And that will be your negative region of the image. That's it, guy. That's a concept that I'm using every time. And everything else, exactly the same. When I say exactly the same, means the interpretation of these two equations will be exactly the same. Except now, for the lens, the positive is now toward the back because that's where the light is supposed to be. And whatever that appears in the front, definitely virtual. Light shouldn't go back to the front of the mirror. I'm sorry, the front of the lens. Okay, you wanna give it a shot and see how it goes? All right, let's give it a try. Here we go. So you have an object, 20 centimeter to the left of a diverging lens. Okay, here we go. All right. 
and there is a focal length given already for this lens 32 centimeter they want you to locate your uh, image location the magnification of the image and actually I control in what type of image is it upright inverted I can, I can tell everything okay let's start once again I'm going to draw <laughs> well it's never gonna go straight here yeah? it's hard uh, okay that's pretty good okay so you have a diverging lens so let me draw a diverging lens here it's gonna look like this okay and when you say diverging lens so let me remind you with this the focal length of this one is diverging right when you say diverging so your focal point is in the front and we say that the front is the negative region for the image from the lens so that's why just want to guarantee you guys that hey this is negative 32 centimeter you guys with me so with this example I can just sort of give you the whole conclusion there that when you have a converging lens this is your positive focal length why because the focal point of the converging lens appears toward the back of the lens which is the positive region of the image for the diverging lens the focal point is in the front and that's the negative region of the image so you get a negative focal length for the diverging lens see not bad okay so with the concepts of where the positive side is supposed to be you can deal with mirror or lenses in the same manner try again here okay so focal point is in the front focal length is negative now you place an object 20 centimeter fine somewhere 20 centimeter but whenever you have a single object that's always positive so over here you say P is positive 20 centimeter that's your object distance and that's it let's apply 1 over P plus 1 over Q equal to 1 over F so 1 over Q is just 1 over F which is negative 32 subtract 1 over P which is positive 20 okay let's work on this a bit so Q is going to be whoa it's gonna be negative okay I can pull that one out uh, you guys can help me with this is 400 over 52 with the negative sign I hope this is right <laughs> is that right some like so okay and actually that numbers goes to <laughs> goes to what equal to what oh let me punch the calculator here I need this it's about 12 or something 460 divided by 52 here we go 12.3 approximately 12.3 negative it's right there okay very good so what does it mean it means okay I draw this one a little bit too small but I hope it's fine <laughs> I hope okay so what it means is right away this mean virtual guarantee the image is virtual so when you say virtual what does it mean it means it's supposed to be in the front of the lens somewhere here you guys with me if the P I'm sorry if the Q the image location is negative it's supposed to be in the negative region of the image which is in the front the light that is positive is mean already in the back of the lens so it's supposed to be somewhere there so if the image is already at 20 so I'm sorry if the object is at 20 so the image is supposed to be somewhere that I mark the X there 12 a little bit beyond half of 20 but then I combine this with 
m equal to negative q over p okay and that's going to be equal to negative q just put the whole thing there negative 12 over 3 divided by p which is positive 20 okay now you see that the final answer is positive okay let me divide this by 50 I'm sorry divided by 20 I get about like point okay point three I get a point six point six there approximately so what does it mean first of all positive sign mean is upright positive what does it mean by point six it means you get a reduction in size so you get the 60% or 0.6 of the original height. So what it means, I can now draw the final image of this one. The image will appear right here at 12.3 or so. That's where the Q is. And then it's still upright, but the height is about 0.6 of the height of the original object. And the image is virtual done okay so conclusion is we get a virtual image at twin 12.3 centimeter in front of the lens It is upright 0.6 magnification. Okay. Oh, it's 0.6 reduction. <laughs> okay, something like that. All right, so as you can see, by having the mirror or lens equation, okay, combined with the magnification equation that has a negative sign in front of it, you can pretty much solve everything about image location from a single object in front. That's it. That's pretty much everything that you need to know, okay? So the only key to solve this one is just follow where the light goes. <laughs> And we take that one to be positive side of the image. For the mirror, reflections, where the light goes, is in the front. So the front of the mirror will be positive size for the image. Lens allow light to refract, so it's penetrate to the other side of the lens. So the light is supposed to go toward the back of the lens. So that will be the positive side for the image. Okay. The place where the light not supposed to be that would be the negative side of the image and that is pretty much complete the whole image formation from a lens okay so the final point for you to take is just this exercise i mean it's not an exercise but i don't think we, we're gonna go this far but i think this is something that if you want to take it as an exercise i think it's good and for those of you that have done like maybe by a lot um biological lab or whatever you, you use like microscope for example in biology lab something like that so the microscope using two lenses there's a lens number one and lens number two okay there's an objective lens and the eyepiece okay so you use the combination of the magnif magnification from these two lenses to magnify the object to be quite big like maybe 50 60 times very easily Okay. And this is the idea when you have multiple lenses or multiple mirrors and all this stuff is, is the idea is very simple. You start from the object and you apply lens equation to figure out where the image from the first lens should be. For example, in this one, the image of the first lens appear right here. Okay, I put the purple arrow right there. And then you take this purple arrow here 
to be the object for the second lens. So you do it one more time. So once you do this, you get the final image of this one right here. Let me use like a big, super big arrow right there. Okay. And that's it. So it's just like you apply the lens equation twice to get to the final image. However, the nice thing about this one is if the lens number one give you magnification of M already, let me put subscript one for that. And then when you do lens number two, you can get the magnification of the lens number two. Of course, the final magnification will be the products between, between the two magnification. Yeah, you just multiply and multiply. So that's why when you have multiple lenses, you can combine those magnifications to get to the total magnifications of the whole system. So it's just a product of all of those M's. All right. And this is a good sort of scenario that showcase the possibility of negative object distance. So imagine this, if that lens number two appear right here, just imagine that. So that means the image from the first lens create behind the lens number two. Okay, one more time. So if the first, I mean, the op, not the first object, there's only one object here. If the object, okay, going through the first lens generate an image that turns out to be behind the lens number two, that is the case when the P can turn negative. This is your negative P. That's now possibility of negative object distance. But then the calculations stay the same, except now your P is negative because you place the object behind the lens. Okay, sounds good. But of course, that's not gonna happen for the microscope because the microscope, you try to keep the focal point of the lens number one to be quite short. So the image that you get is always in the front of the second lens. And that's allow you to get a large multiplication magnifications from the microscope. All right. So however, in this course, we're not going to do negative object distance or anything, but just so you can see when the negative object distance might occur okay, in, in your calculations. Okay. Sounds cool. All right. So I would say this one just for those who keen to try, <laughs> but this is like optional. All right, you don't need to go through this one. I think that's more than enough if you know how to figure out the image uh, location from an object in front of the either lens or mirror. I think that's good, okay? But multiple lenses, I think maybe that's a bit too much, even though it's interesting, all right? We can do that if you want for those of you that wanna try and then if you have any question, okay? But if you try this one once, it's going to be clear to you guys that is very, very straightforward. Yeah, it's just, you do it two times and then you're done. Okay, sounds cool guys. All right, so I think that's finished today's lecture. I don't know, it seems kind of longer than it's supposed to be. 